Hello, everyone. There has been a rapid increase in the generosity of pro-natalist public policies in Poland. However, some individuals remain childless in the country. And to explore uh, when and why family policy doesn't work sometimes, we invite Dorota Szeleva from the University College Dublin in Ireland. She will let us know more about motives and welfare attitudes among child-free persons in Poland. I'm Rodrigo Silva, and today let's talk about social inclusion. Dorota, welcome to our episode. Hello. Hi, everyone. So the first question for you is, why is this topic important? So I would start with saying a few words about the recent research on welfare state and family policy. So as you rightly pointed out, uh, there has been a lot of new family policy tools, uh, not only in Poland, but in other countries that are right now struggling with uh, demographic decline. And that's how it is uh, often labeled. And um, so there has been a lot of focus on families with children, both in research and in uh, social policy welfare state practice. And of course, in Poland, uh, that's a very specific case because you have this very explicit pronatalist policies being implemented. And uh, that's why I think in this context, we sometimes forget that there is this growing group of people who are voluntarily childless. And I also use in my research the label child free um, uh, in this article as well. Um, so my point was to try to explore what this group, um, what, are the, what, is, what are the motivations of these groups, uh, what are their experiences, um, uh, how how do they feel in this atmosphere and um, in this context of a growing support for families with children and this very, very explicit pronatalist uh, policies? How are they, um, how, how are they re receiving this type of uh, policies and this very specific uh, discourse uh, in Poland? Okay. And so going a little bit further on that, so when you started this research, so what were you hoping to find? What were your expectations with your research? First of all, I thought that uh, we need to, because we know so little about this group, it's so understudied, we have to explore this topic a little bit more. Uh, so I, uh, my research um, strategy was to actually do interviews, qualitative interviews uh, with this group. And I wanted to ask them about exactly about their motivations, about their experiences, and about their needs, about their societal roles. So I wanted to explore this topic a little bit more. I just wanted to be open uh, for whatever I will find. And the second um, bigger question I wanted to ask them was about their attitudes towards these family policies, exactly how they feel, how was their reception uh, of, um, of this increasing support for uh, families. And uh, I wanted to treat them uh, as um, welfare state contributors because they are taxpayers, they contribute to welfare state. And uh, in the big, bigger welfare state research, there is also this question of welfare state legitimacy. So are they supporting uh, these policies? Uh, what type of family policies are they are supporting? What they are their expectations towards welfare policies? Uh, these were my hopes. They were big, um, but um, at least I wanted to start with this particular research. I wanted to start exploring this, um, I think, understudied topic. Of course. And now let's jump into the findings. So what are the most important uh, findings of your research? So I would, um, basically, I would divide them in uh, three topics. First of all, this is about the, um, something that I was interested in uh, very much about the welfare state support. So, so the support of the child-free growing population of child-free persons for uh, particular welfare uh, policies and family policies in particular. And um, one could think, and um, that was my hypothesis at the beginning, that uh, if, 
they are child-free, if they're not interested in these policies, they would not support it because they don't need it. They don't need a kindergarten, they don't need childcare, they don't need family benefits because they don't have children. Um, but what I found was that actually um, they, they're not against these policies. They are very supportive, but they have very specific uh, opinion about these policies and they prefer um, a certain type of policies. So they prefer if uh, the state invests in early childhood and care services, uh, if the state supports female employment. So this, this were their preferences that came very strong from these interviews. And at the same time, they uh, had uh, a lot of critique against generous cash transfers and any types of uh, cash for care instruments in Poland, especially. And that's important in the Polish case uh, because um, a couple of years ago, the, uh, the government introduced like, a huge, very generous program of cash transfers for families with children. So they opposed this program very much and instead they supported um, any type of policies that would um, help and support uh, parental employment. Uh, the second um, result was more about their own experiences. So that, is, that, that was the, explo the explorative part. Uh, that was the part when I wanted to ask them how they feel in this you know, pro-natalist context and uh, society, how, how they feel of child-free persons. And uh, they said that the acceptance for their lifestyle is limited, but this is changing. And some brought examples from their family, and societal pressure, friends' pressure, while others argued that they are completely accepted in their circles. Um, at their workplace, sometimes they said they are perceived as more available, more ready to work, uh, on typical hours or on demand. And uh, that was some, somehow raised as if work-life balance policies are only for parents and not for child-free persons. So that was something that some of them raised as well. Some also had um, other caring responsibilities. So they were arguing, although we, we are not parents, we don't have children, we still have uh, caring responsibilities. And uh, they, they, can, they can take care of their parents, of their um, uh, brothers, sisters. So uh, they also sometimes do have the same struggles uh, as parents do and tensions between a family and work obligations. And the third thing I was um, uh, I, I was asking them, and the, the third type of result that I got from these interviews was that I asked them this question, would they change their mind if, uh, if, if they were offered a very generous family policy package or uh, if they were living in a perfect world, would they change their mind? And all of them said, uh, maybe with the exception of one person, that they would never change their mind, that they would um, definitely stay with this decision not to have children. And one person said that even if I was offered $1 million, I would never have, have a child. I would never decide to be a parent. Um, so, so I guess that, that can be, these were the main results of this study. Absolutely. Three very distinct uh, findings uh, in your research. Can you let us know how this uh, research can uh, have a, like a real life translation? So what? how does it impact individuals, people's um, public policies, etc.? Um, maybe I will start with the, the other um, issue I mentioned, so that family policies don't work. And this is also in the title of uh, my article. And I think it's important. And sometimes policymakers uh, makers just assume that if they apply um, certain family policy instruments of welfare state tools, if they reform policies, people will react immediately. And I guess... Um, what comes from this study is that there is an increasing group, uh, growing group of persons that would not react to this increased support for families with children. Uh, however, and this is like the second um, issue I wanted to, to talk about uh, in this context, um, these people also have their own needs and um, they were often mentioning that sometimes they feel left out by welfare policies as if welfare policies are only for families with children. So they expect um, the state to be more inclusive 
uh, the welfare policies to be uh, more uh, inclusive. F for example, uh, they mentioned that there was in Poland this uh, holiday voucher available uh, only to families with children, and that was to boost the touristic sector, uh, especially after COVID. But they were asking why why do we don't we get this uh, type of support as well? We would use it. We would also like to uh, feel supported, and we are also part of this society. Um, some of the female respondents, they were also um, referring to um, access to reproductive health services. They were saying that they are all, all, almost always treated as potential mothers, for example, by uh, gynecologists that are not respecting their child-free choice, their nine, the nine agency. So there were several, I would say, um, uh, demands, maybe this is like a too big word, but um, there is there are some expectations on the side of this group um, uh, for the state to react. They feel they are taxpayers, they are contributors, uh, they co contribute to society in many different ways. So they also want to sometimes uh, um, receive some support from the state, just as families with children do. Of course, because they feel a bit overlooked uh, when compared to uh, the other group. What do you think now it's uh, left now to uh, research? So what's what doors does your research opens for future work? Mm -hmm. I, I realized that actually, um, first of all, this was research that was conducted in Poland. So um, that might be um, one limitation of this study. So uh, the Polish context is quite specific. There's a political domination of the right-wing uh, conservative party with their conservative attitudes towards gender roles. Uh, as I said before, quite intensive pronatalist uh, policies and politics. And um, so I, I, would, I would say that um, because I'm also doing normally uh, comparative studies, there is opportunity to, uh, to, to conduct similar study in a comparative context to see how uh, these welfare attitudes of child-free people may differ, differ in various welfare regimes, in different uh, cultural contexts, or maybe, they, maybe this group is uh, very similar. Maybe this group is also internally different this is something that um, uh, I didn't uh, have opportunity to explore, uh, but the results may be different with regards to gender, class, um, age, ethnicity, and so on. So quite, quite I would say, quite many opportunities for uh, further research here as well. Of course, still a lot to explore in this topic. Uh, just uh, the last question for you would be, uh, do you have any additional resources, articles, materials to share uh, with our listeners about this topic? And of course, some self-promotion is uh, authorized <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> well, I I mean, I would just, um, um, my, my contact with the uh, child-free community, let's say, uh, started on Facebook. And uh, there is this Polish group that also helped me uh, a lot to recruit the, my respondents, um, uh, the webpage called Bezdzietnik, and I don't know how to uh, translate it into Polish, um, but uh, there is this person also who wrote a whole book about her experience as a child-free person, and uh, this book is unfortunately only available in Polish. Uh, the author's name is Edyta Broda, uh, but also I would, uh, I mean, I I had contact with uh, the child-free communities on different types of social network, um, um, fan book pages, and and this is how this is how I um, well recommend to have um, the first I would say contact with the real people who tell their stories. Uh, there are also podcasts. Uh, uh, like We Are Child Free, um, Apple Podcast. Um, uh, there is not so much research done, but I, um, I, I think this is something that, you know, we, we can just try to fill in this gap in the future. Absolutely. Uh, this episode that you just listened to is available on Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website, on Kojitatu's YouTube channel, as well as in podcast directories. Dorota, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.